I'm very pleased to introduce Avery Paxton with NOAA. Avery is connecting to us this morning from her home in Moorhead City, and she's been with uh, NOAA for about one year. Avery, uh, take it away. Thank you, Keith. I'm really excited to have the opportunity to share some of our team's research with you all today. And what I'll be talking about is a synthesis that I conducted with my colleagues at NOAA, National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science, as well as NOAA Fisheries. And I'm going to frame my talk today in terms of ocean planning. And so when we think about ocean planning, it involves decisions on how different spaces in the ocean are used. And one of the big things that this includes is the siting and installation of artificial structures. And as we know, these come in many different shapes and sizes. They can include renewable energy infrastructure associated with, for example, shown here, offshore wind. They can include oil and gas infrastructure, aquaculture infrastructure, as well as this kind of extreme example in Dubai, shown here with this aerial photograph of human-made islands, which you can see is these um, complex geometric shapes. And then artificial reefs as well fall into this ocean planning puzzle. And so when we think about artificial reefs and how they're part of the ocean planning puzzle, two big things come to mind. The first is that it's a question of what material we should be sinking. And artificial reefs come in many different shapes and sizes. They include decommissioned vessels, they include purposely designed concrete modules, as well as secondary use structures like concrete pipes. And one of the planning related pieces of this is where do we place these structures in the offshore ocean environment. And so I'm with NOAA and the National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science. And one of the things that we do as a group is we conduct science to help support ocean planning decisions. And one of the components of our portfolio now is on conducting science to support planning, siting, and management decisions for artificial reefs across seascapes. And our team got into the artificial reef arena actually through offshore wind energy and studying historic shipwrecks. And one of the common questions that came up with offshore wind as well as shipwrecks is how are these artificial structures functioning? And so through this lens, we then began to investigate artificial reefs more specifically. And we were really interested in determining how the ecological function of artificial reefs varies or similar to those of nearby natural reefs, such as the rocky reef shown in this right-hand image. And this was an important question for our team because oftentimes artificial reefs are installed with one of the intentions being to mimic or enhance habitat provided by natural reefs, whether it's a rocky reef like I have here or potentially a coral reef. And so our team has conducted uh, a variety of field surveys using remotely operated vehicles, using diver conducted surveys. And some of the things that we have found related to the function of these artificial reefs is that they can facilitate fish such as tropical species and subtropical species that are at the edge of their climate ranges. We've also found that artificial reefs can support large reef associated predators, especially those that like to hang out in the water column and are more transiently associated with these structures like barracuda, mackerel, jacks, and some sharks. And so these field-based studies were conducted at a more localized environment. The two that I just spoke about were conducted off North Carolina in the Southeast US. And this led our team to then try to investigate artificial reefs across seascapes. So we scaled up and began to try to quantify the footprint of artificial reefs in the US coastal ocean. And I really encourage you to tune into the next talk where one of my colleagues, Damie Stewart, will be sharing our team's efforts um, to quantify the footprint of artificial reefs nationally. To do this, we conducted a meta-analysis where we first asked the question, do fish community metrics differ between artificial reefs and natural reference reefs? And the natural reference reefs that we looked at were either coral reefs or rocky reefs, depending on the geographic location. 
The second thing we wanted to ask and answer was what potential mechanisms might explain any differences that we saw in fish community metrics on artificial versus these natural reference reefs. And so our team, which included scientists from NOAA and COS, where I'm based, as well as NOAA Fisheries, the Southeast Fisheries Science Center, we searched the peer-reviewed literature and we found over 500 papers that were potentially relevant to help us address our two research questions. We then screened each paper and found 39, so approximately 40 that met our inclusion criteria, meaning that they reported values of fish community metrics for artificial structures, as well as this control or reference you can think of as the rocky reefs or coral reefs. And from these papers, we are then able to extract the metrics on density, fish biomass, species richness, as well as diversity. And the studies that we included, there's approximately 40 studies that had the key information we needed for our meta-analysis, were pretty widespread globally. They include studies from all continents with the exception of Antarctica. And what did we find? Well, we found that artificial reefs globally do tend to perform well compared to the natural reefs. And I'm gonna break this down a little bit. So if you follow my cursor, if we're looking at the x-axis, we have fish community metrics. We have density, biomass, richness, and diversity. And I'm now going to show you points associated with each of these fish community metrics. If a point occurs in this area, it'll mean that the artificial reef performs better than the natural reef. If instead the point occurs down here, it means the opposite. It means that the natural reef will perform better. And if the point and or its confidence intervals overlap with this zero line, that means that the two reef types exhibit similar performance in terms of these four fish community metrics. And so we found that for all of the community metrics, for density, biomass, richness, and diversity, the artificial reefs tended to perform similarly to the natural reefs. And this was something that was really encouraging to our team because since artificial reefs are often installed to hopefully function similarly to nearby natural reefs, this was reassuring to see that if we look at this broad sweep globally, zeroing in on these four community metrics, that the artificial reefs are tending to perform similarly to their natural reef equivalents. And we wanted to look a little bit deeper though. And when we did this, we found that even though artificial reefs globally seem to be effective tools for fish community enhancement, that there's nuances. And so these reefs are not one size fits all. So I'm now gonna show you a series of three of these plots, very similar to what we looked at earlier, where if the point is up here, it means the artificial reef performs better than the natural reef. We're gonna look at density now, and we're going to look at a particular factor related to geography and how that may influence this relationship. So we see ocean basin on the x-axis, and we found that artificial reefs in the Atlantic, for example, tend to perform better than their natural reef equivalents. When we looked at the latitude zone, so another way of looking at geography, we found that subarctic reefs, although there were very few of them that we included in the study, um, they did tend to perform a bit better than the rocky or coral, I guess rocky reefs since it's subarctic equivalents. And when we looked at material, we looked at metal, we looked at concrete, boulders, mixed materials, as well as tires. And while we don't have many samples for the boulders mixed in tires, because of that, we can't really draw too many solid inferences. But for the metal and the concrete, we found that the metal artificial reefs tend to perform similarly for fish density to the natural reefs, while concrete tended to outperform some of the nearby natural reefs. And so when we think about what we can take away from this meta-analysis, this rigorous synthesis of peer-reviewed literature, the main thing for me is that 
we found that these artificial reefs can support similar fish community metrics globally to natural reefs, whether it's a rocky or a coral reef. But when we looked under the hood a little bit more, we found these important nuances in performance with geographic location. So things like latitude zone and ocean basin, as well as the material that the artificial reef structure is composed of. And so when we think about what this means, what the implications are, um, the way I like to think of it is that this study, while it globally demonstrates that artificial reefs can be effective tools for enhancing fish communities, they're not one size fits all. And because of that, we need to make sure that we're strategically planning artificial reefs based on location specific scientific assessments and resource needs to help us maximize the benefits associated with deploying these structures on the seafloor. And so with that, I will thank my collaborators, including Kyle Schertzer, Todd Kellison, and Nate Batchelor from NOAA NIMFS, as well as Chris Taylor and Ken Riley from NOAA NCOS. The photos that I've shared today were taken by our colleague, John McCord, and the illustrations were um, conducted by our colleague, Alex Borisma. And I'll be happy to take questions in the Q&A session. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you, Avery. Now I'm very pleased to introduce Dami Stewart. She is formerly with Duke and partnering with NOAA, and she's contacting us today from her home in San Diego. Welcome, Dami. Take it away. Hey, thank you so much, Keith. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Dami Stewart, and I'm really excited to share with you a project I've been working on for the past two years with my colleagues at NOAA. So let's get started talking about quantifying the benthic footprint of artificial reefs in the US coastal ocean. We all know the function and importance of artificial reefs since we're here at the Florida Artificial Reef Summit. They bring incredible efforts led by many here at the summit to collect data and estimate the amount of material on the seafloor, the number of modules, pipes, etc., and estimate the coverage at regional levels. But there's not previously been a national effort to estimate the coverage of the material on the seafloor, the footprint of these artificial reefs nationally. Our objective for this study is to quantify the benthic footprint of artificial reefs in the coastal ocean and determine the spatial distribution of these artificial reefs. Specifically, we are examining the structure type, material, depth, year deployed, and geographic region, among various other attributes included in the data sets. Our study is going to encompass all US state managed coastal oceanic reefs. This project initially began two years ago as my senior thesis at Duke University, where we were looking at the Southeast. Recently, we made the decision to expand to the entire United States. Today, I'm going to present the Southeast as a pilot study. When we started out, we made the assumption that the data sets across these states would be relatively standard and easy to work with one another. And we quickly realized this was not the case. Uh, we had to develop three different methods to work with all these different kinds of data. And these three methods that we developed are actual footprint, permanent plots, and structure categories. I'm going to present one method per state for you all today. Actual footprint for North Carolina, permanent plots for Georgia, and lastly, structure categories for South Carolina. Starting off with actual footprint. Actual footprint is the most accurate, uh, excuse me, accurate approach. Delineated from side scan sonar or multi-beam bathymetry, structure areas are accurate down to a finite scale. North Carolina has the actual footprint for every artificial reef in their program and served as a model for all states in the Southeast. As you can see here, three vessels have been identified in this imagery in addition to some metal on the bottom. Here we have overlaid a couple of polygons for you all. Um, the delineated footprint is not always perfect and does not line up exactly with the deployment, but we take these delineated files and assume these footprints to be the truth for the study. And these are some assumptions that we have carried on throughout this study. The permanent plots method utilized data from North Carolina. Given the completeness of North Carolina's data set, we were able to calculate the minimum, mean, and maximum percent benthic coverage within each permanent plot. As you can see here on the left, 
the mean coverage within North Carolina is 0.99%. This plot is a reef in North Carolina with just less than 1% coverage. These North Carolina percent values were then multiplied by a state's known permanent plot size, in this case, Georgia, to estimate the potential benthic footprint. Here are the results for Georgia. On the y-axis, we have the artificial reef permanent plot ID. On the x-axis, we have the benthic footprint in kilometers squared. The black dot represents the permanent plot size, while the blue dot represents our estimated benthic footprint. Inevitably, as plot size increases with this method, as does the estimated benthic footprint. This method assumes that the permanent plot is proportional to the amount of material deployed, and this is not always the exact relationship. Additionally, this method utilizes North Carolina data and takes on those assumptions. The last method utilizes structure categories. Each state's unique structure types deployed are assigned to broad structure categories broken up by material and further by type. As you can see here, we have concrete, metal, rubber, unknown, fiberglass, wood, plastic, and rock. Each of these structure categories have area values associated with them determined by states with actual footprint estimates. In this case, these area values were determined from North Carolina data. Each category has a minimum, mean, and maximum area estimate to take into account possible variation within each category. And here we have the results for South Carolina. Same graph as last time. On the y-axis, we have the artificial reef permanent plot ID. On the x-axis, we have the benthic footprint in kilometers squared. The black dot represents the permanent plot size, and the blue dot represents our estimated benthic footprint. But this time, we see that the footprint does not vary with plot size when the structure type is taken into consideration. In creating the structure categories, they were left intentionally broad to include a variety of structures across states. In doing so, some detail was lost, um, but we tried to maintain as much specificity as possible to continue across state boundaries. Again, assumptions from North Carolina were continued through this method. Um, as the area values were determined from North Carolina data. This method works well for single structure deployments. Think about a single ship. However, it's much more difficult with multiple structures with a field of pipes when gaps of sand between the pipes are introduced. I would like to mention that off the coast of North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, our calculations yielded a benthic footprint equivalent to that of 140 American football fields. So far, we have begun direct collaboration with the states listed on this slide. Of these states, we have utilized the following methods. For the coastal states not listed, we're beginning discussions and deciding on which methods are best applicable. In conclusion, there are several benefits and implications of expanding the study to the entire United States. The first being filling the knowledge gap regarding how much of the seafloor artificial reef material is covering. Second, with this information, we have the ability to compare natural reefs to artificial reefs, a study that is already taking place in North Carolina as a direct result of this study. Third, this has the potential to set the stage for more accurate measurements through imagery techniques across the United States. Lastly, this project has initiated collaborations with programs and we'll continue these conversations. By the end of our analysis, we will have a single estimate for the coverage of all artificial reef material that has been deployed in the US coastal ocean. I would like to acknowledge Avery Paxson and the team at NOAA that has been working with me for the last two years on this project. Chris Taylor, Ken Riley, Nate Batchelor, and Todd Kellison. In addition to everyone at the various artificial reef programs who's contributed data and continues to work with us on this analysis. And with that, please place any questions you may have in the Q&A. I would love to answer them. Thank you so much. I'm pleased to introduce Mike McAllister with Harbor Branch at Florida Atlantic University. Mike has been with FAU for four years and is connecting from his home in Fort Pierce, Florida. Welcome, Mike. Take it away. Thank you, Keith, and good morning, everyone. Today, I'll be talking about assessing fish communities on St. Lucie County mesophotic artificial reefs. Developing artificial reefs is a top priority for the Fish and Wildlife Artificial Reef Program. Yet despite the popularity and support of these programs, 
scientific understanding of how these artificial reefs ecologically facilitate marine fisheries is limited, particularly for artificial reefs at mesophotic depths. Although previous studies have compared fish communities between artificial reefs that are made of vessels to those on natural reefs at mesophotic depths, there has been no studies comparing the fish communities between artificial reef types. In addition, off St. Lucie County, despite a vast number of artificial reef deployments, to date, most of the assessments of fish communities have been limited to qualitative surveys with no quantitative assessments done. The objective of this project was to develop a standardized method of fish community assessment on mesophotic artificial reefs, as well as to examine differences in fish assemblages between different artificial reef types at mesophotic depths and document any purported winter spawning activity. This study was completed at the St. Lucie County Sport Fish Artificial Reef Site between 2007 and 2018. The study sites are here in the red box and comprised six sites that were paired together across the depth gradient from 28 to 56 meters. There was vessel and concrete rubble sites, one site of each type in each depth strata, and sampling was conducted between winter and summer seasons. Two methodologies were employed for this study. We used a combination of vertical longline sampling, which allowed us to sample sites twice per season using methods that are uh, employed by the NOAA CMAP program to assess the fish communities on the artificial reefs. Using the data from the vertical longline surveys, we were able to look at the effects of season, structure, depth, and site on catch per unit effort, as well as look at the uh, size composition of fishes that were caught on these reefs. We also employed beta remote underwater video sampling techniques or BRUVs. These were done at five of the six sites and we were limited to our depths at the uh, deepest site. And we were able to look at the fish community structure at these sites, uh, looking at both species diversity using continuous counts, as well as species abundance using a mean max N or minimum count. Uh, when we're looking at abundance, we used a single factor permanova and simper analysis to look at differences uh, within the community structure and what factors were affecting community structure. So for the vertical long line, we had 88 sampling events over the course of the two seasons, uh, 53 in the summer, 35 in the winter. We caught a total of 140 fish representing 14 different species. Of all the catch, two species comprised the majority of the catch, uh, about 70%, being red snapper and vermilion snapper. And if you look to the right, you will see uh, length histograms for the lengths of both these species. And you'll notice that for 16% of the red snapper and 33% of the red snapper were only over the minimum size limit. So the majority of the fish that we were catching were below legal harvesting sizes. When looking at the, uh, what factors had an effect on catch per unit effort at these sites, we saw that structure uh, played a large role in catch per unit effort with higher CPUEs for both red snapper as well as overall on rubble artificial reefs compared to vessels. Depth had a significant effect as well with red snapper being significantly, having significantly higher CPUEs on reefs greater than 40 meters in fact, no red snapper were caught less than 30 meters. And vermilion snapper were, had a significantly higher CPUE on reefs less than 30 meters. And then site also played a role in this. Uh, and as you can see here, site A, which is where we caught the majority of the red snapper is driving this significant effect of site. Um, for vermilion snapper, it's largely driven by the high abundance of vermilion snapper that were caught at one of our shallower sites. Moving on to the BRUVs, we were able to conduct 19 BRUVs over the course of the sampling period, 10 in the winter, nine in the summer uh, at, at the five sites. Uh, species counts, uh, the BRUVs, BRUVs showed a total of 62 different species that were observed, representing 25 families. We're looking at species accumulation curves. We see that based on uh, Michaelis Menten S max, we should have observed up to 63 species and our counts and BRUV sampling uh, observed 62. So we had a sufficient sample size to accurately assess 
the species community uh, composition at these sites. And looking at the brubs, we found that after 30 minutes, almost 70% of the total number of species were observed. And after a total of 60 minutes, we had 86% of the species observed. In general, diversity on the artificial reefs was greater during the winter season compared to the summer season. Moving, delving into what factors influence community structure, we see that season, depth, and site all had significant effects on the community composition. Season, we see that sites in the winter months tended to cluster together, uh, and then sites during the summer months tended to cluster together. So we saw different compositions between the two seasons. Same for depths, uh, sites that were less than 30 meters all clustered together and had similar species composition. And then sites deeper than 40 meters also had similar uh, clustered together with similar species compositions. The one exception being uh, one of the shallow sites during the winter tended to have a more similar species composition to those sites that were deeper than 40 meters. And lastly, we see that there is a significant effect of site, which is likely driving some of these uh, other uh, significant effects, largely with the shallow site midway clustering together. Now, when we look at what species are driving these uh, significant effects, the SIMP analysis results showed that three different species are responsible for the majority of these differences. Tom Tate's red snapper and vermilion snapper contributing anywhere from nine to 15% of the difference in species composition. During the winter months, we see greater abundances of all species compared to the summer months. At sites shallower than 30 meters, we see Tom Tate's and vermilion snapper comprising the majority of the species. Whereas at sites greater than 40 meters, we see red snapper as the dominant species. And then again, we see the effect of site here with Midway having a uh, higher species composition of vermilion snapper and Tom Tate's compared to deeper sites like site A and 140 Reef, which were dominated largely by red snapper. So in conclusion, mesophotic artificial reefs support a diverse com fish community off St. Lucie County with rubble reefs generally having greater abundances than vessels. Overall, abundance is generally greater during winter months. And this is likely driven to summertime upwelling events. And we see that the differences in the fish communities at these sites are driven by two to three species, with shallower reefs dominated by vermilion snapper and tomtates, and the deeper reefs being dominated by red snapper. And both the findings from the BRUVs and the vertical longline data were consistent and supported each other. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone and I will take any questions if there are time. And I'd like to introduce Sarah Tanner. Sarah is calling us from her uh, home in Miami, and she's been with Miami-Dade County now for 20 years. Welcome, Sarah, and take it away. Thanks. Um, I am the Artificial Reef Coordinator for Miami-Dade County, along with uh, many other job res uh, responsibilities, but I'm here to present on the reevaluation of module and boulder reefs that we did in 2019 with an FWC grant. So a little bit of the study overview, we looked at artificial reefs that we evaluated about a decade ago through previous grants, and we wanted to be able to describe changes over time and collect information that we could use for future management goals. Uh, the benthic assemblages were processed, um, we processed images through CPC or coral point count, and that gave us a relative percent cover. And then we also surveyed fish using a modified bonzac Bannero method. Um, basically, we swam around a 15 diameter circle, um, counting and um, estimating sizes of the fish within that cylinder. We completed these surveys over five boulder reefs and two module reefs. And here's where they're located, starting in the northern part of the county. We um, surveyed the Golden Beach boulders, which is three boulder piles that are high relief. Um, just offshore of the Hallover Inlet is the Sunny Isles boulders and modules. These are scattered amongst each other, and the boulders are all low relief, so single layer. Uh, the Anchorage boulders, which is a long uh, row of boulders, high relief. Uh, the Port at Miami A modules, which are about space 25 feet apart. And then the Port of Miami boulders, which were deployed in long rows and in piles that we looked at a little bit separately. 
So a quick overview of what we saw on the benthic assemblages in 2019 was that the most sites are dominated by turf algae, which is uh, pretty common and, and you know, comparable to what we see on the natural reefs. Some things that stood out was that the Port of Miami boulder rose and piles had a higher cover of octocorals than the other sites. And then the module sites, they had a higher cover of uh, sponges. And then the lower leaf boulders at Sunny Isles had a large percent of um, abiotic, which was basically sedimentation, um, likely just due to their lower leaf. Um, some notable changes that we saw from the previous survey to 2019 was that we saw the successional transition at the Golden Beach boulders. Um, when we first surveyed these, it was only a few years after their deployment and they were highly colonized by uh, tunicates and then the purple or the pink rope sponge, which is kind of like a pioneering species. And we saw those decrease in 2019 and give rise to higher hard coral cover and octocoral cover. We also saw a notable decline of hard coral at the Port of Miami A modules. Um, it was largely due to a single species, Oculina diffusa. You can see here in uh, our previous study, uh, we had large spherical colonies of this branching coral, um, but they were virtually absent in 2019. Um, and there was a 10 year gap and there was a lot of things that happened during this period. So it's hard to attribute what caused this decline. Um, there was a port of Miami dredging, there were some peak temperatures causing bleaching, there was a stony coral tissue loss disease outbreak, um, and as well as a couple of hurricanes that passed by, probably most notably Irma. So it's hard to tell exactly what caused this decline. We also documented the invasive orange cup coral on two of the um, seven sites, the Golden Beach boulders and the port of Miami boulder rose. A switch in gear to some of the highlights from the fish. Um, the, graph below shows the density of fish um, during the previous studies and in 2019. The number you see in parentheses is just the number of independent surveys that we did that uh, we averaged to produce this graph. So you can see that the Anchorage and the Golden Beach boulders um, had the highest density and these sites were heavily dominated by Tom Tates. You can see in the upper right picture is at the Golden Beach site. Um, in 2019, we saw a lower density um, on the two Port of Miami uh, boulder piles in the rows. Um, this decline in density we believe is partially due to fewer tomtates that we observed at these sites in 2019. And then we also saw a drop in the, um, the, uh, the fish density at the Sunny Isles mitigation and modules. And this is largely due to mass gobies were, weren't very common this year um, in 2019 as they were in previous studies. So looking at how these fish assemblages um, were laid out, again, the anchorage and boulders were heavily dominated by grunts, which the Tom Tates played the factor there. Um, we saw that the grunts were nearly absent from the Sunny Isles boulders, the lower leaf boulders. And then we saw that wrasses and damsel and chromis fish and gobies were pretty common across all our sites. Uh, diving a little deeper into the sport fish or game fish. Um, in the previous studies, about a decade ago, we noticed 24 species across all our surveys. And in 2019, there was only 18. Looking at the amberjack, um, we saw them at both the Port of Miami boulder rows and pile surveys. But in 2019, we only saw them at Port of Miami A, which is the upper right picture, but all were below the legal harvest size. As far as hogfish, we observed them on about 50% of our surveys in both survey periods, a decade ago and now, but all were below the legal harvest size. There were a few high, at, uh, larger ones at the upper end, like maybe uh, 39 centimeters, but not obviously um, above that harvesting threshold. Uh, the barracuda, we did not observe any in the previous surveys, but we did see four in 2019, um, and two were within the legal slot limit size. Looking at the snapper family, we had a positive trend on the mutton snapper. We didn't observe any previously, um, but in 2019, we saw 20 and one of them was legally harvested, uh, harvest size. Um, the gray snapper, we saw opposite trend. We saw a decrease in density, um, average and max size in 2019. And then the yellowtail snapper, we saw an increased density in 2019, but the overall um, average link remained the same around 20 centimeters there was less than 4% that were legally harvest um, yellowtail snappers. Uh, looking at the grunts, we saw um, red, gag, and scamp in the previous monitoring a decade ago, 
but none in 2019. But we did see four black grouper in 2019 and two of them were legal size. Uh, looking at the protective goliath grouper, we saw one in, um, in 2007 on the Golden Beach boulders. And then we saw one in um, 2019 on the Sunny Isles modules. Um, it is believed these modules, the grouper here was just visiting because there's some higher relief wrecks, maybe 500 feet to the north. And then lionfish, we saw none in the prior years, um, but we saw at least one at every site in 2019. Um, so just kind of to bring it all to conclusion and some management recommendations that we're going to look at for future planning for our program is that high relief and large footprints, we found that the grunts were less dominant. So we had more even, um, even measures across the board. But at the high relief small footprints like the Anchorage and Golden Beach boulders, we saw large schools of grunts, mainly the tom tapes that dominated the, the fish composition. We also found that we found more game fish on the higher reliefs, but not necessarily any um, correlation to larger size um, that could actually be harvested. And we found that the low relief reefs, they better mimic the natural hard bottom. So they have a limited fishery enhancement um, potential if that's um, you know, the project goal. And we found that both the modules and boulders uh, provided sufficient habitat for benthic settlement. And for some reason, the modules had a higher sponge cover. Um, in a perfect world, going forward, we'd love to improve our biological monitoring, um, but we need sufficient budget and staff capabilities to tackle this. But we really need repeatable long-term and possibly fate tracking for our benthic species. Um, like the oculine example I gave, we really have no idea what the cause was or if there's anything we could do to manage differently to prevent that. Um, obviously more fish surveys would be great so we could determine you know any fluctuation in those grunt um, assemblages to see if they change or it's always dominated by tom tates or if there's any you know seasonality to anything and then we also always have tons of research questions that we'd like answered so if there's any grad students out there that want to work for free i have plenty of projects i could throw your way um, and then 2019, we also ran into a lot of marine debris issues. On our surveys, we saw monofilament. Um, we saw lines from anchors and um, lobster traps, the anchors themselves, the you know, lobster traps themselves, either intact or broken up. So it brought up a lot of more research questions for us. You know, we'd like to be able to identify what the negative effects are, the accumulation rates, the types. I mean, if there are differences between artificial reefs, um, and to gather this information so we can develop an effective marine debris um, management and removal strategy going forward. And with that, um, I'll throw up my email address in case anybody wants the full report on this, and I'm happy to take questions um, in the time provided. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Amber Whittle, who is the Director of Conservation for the Florida Aquarium. Take it away, Amber. Thanks, Ange. And I know we have, we had a big week this week, but I have no idea what happened since we are pre-recording. Um, but I'm going to talk about using the intersection between coral restoration and artificial reef construction. So I think everyone has seen this series that Phil Dustin did from Carey's Fort Reef. It shows the decimation of the the Acropora patches in one of the iconic reefs of the Keys. And that decimation is also documented in the FWC does long-term coral monitoring. And they also do a couple of other parameters. You can see that they do octocoral and macroalgae. When this started over 20 years ago, there was 12 to 13% coral cover. And now the 2019 numbers for the Florida Keys are 5.5%. For Southeast Florida, it dropped just in the last couple of years from 3% to 1.5%. So they've lost about 50% of their corals. You can also see that the macroalgae is increasing um, the last three years pretty dramatically. So, the 1996 numbers aren't the full picture. You can see from Phil Dustin's pictures that he started that in 1975. And 
if you look at the 1960s numbers, they're anywhere between 50 and 60% coral cover. So from 50 to 60% down to 5.5%. So the current state of coral conservation, there's a major disease outbreak that started in 2014 in Miami, and it has gone north and south throughout the Keys, and it has now gone completely through the Marquesas. Um, the CREMP team was just down in the dry tortugas and it hasn't hit the tortugas yet. So the loss of the Southeast Florida corals is attributed to this stony coral tissue loss disease. It affects about half of the coral species in Florida and it has different rates of mortality, some 100%, some less, but it is a virulent disease that is truly decimating the corals. So the FWC and NOAA and a couple of other partners took a bold action of starting to take corals out of the wild ahead of the disease boundary. So this has been going on for multiple years. They've done 70 sites and they've taken out almost 2,000 corals. And so you can see from this dashboard that FWC um, maintains that a lot of the corals are going to universities, but also to aquariums within the Aquarium and um, Zoos Association. So who's gonna hold these corals long-term? Are we gonna put them back? We're not quite sure what the plan is, but at the Florida Aquarium, we have about 117 of them and we're maintaining them. They're growing like crazy. So we've had to put them in some new tanks. Um, but we're also making babies, which is the most exciting thing. Some species reproduce just fine in the coral greenhouses, and some um, reproduce much better in our lab-induced spawning, where we mimic the natural cues for coral spawning. But either way, we end up with babies. So now we have these babies, and we grow them out, and then we hand them over to restoration practitioners to put out. So we get asked over and over and over, why would we be putting out our babies into a situation that is causing such major loss of adult corals and juvenile corals in the wild. So this is where we need your help. Ilsa and her team at USGS produced this paper last year that talked about how the erosion rate of the reef structure is outpacing the calcification rate, so the growth rate. So this is where artificial reefs can become a really, really important part of coral restoration, but it needs to be done in a scientific and thoughtful manner. And there are different ideas for this. So, you know, Moat Marine does their microfragging. They use old dead coral heads and put, um, put microfrag corals on it, and then they grow together and they become reproductively viable in the last paper said about a fourth of the time that it would take naturally. So you can see on the right that there's a picture of the microfrag array, but it takes a lot of time and effort to put those on the reef. If you had this artificial reef structure um, that the, that the uh, designers at the bottom have created, they could just plug those microfrags in and it would happen a lot faster and they wouldn't be relying on very specific coral heads. There are also a couple of examples of other artificial reef structures that have come out in the last couple of um, months that I've been tracking this. So I just have, this one's from the University of Delaware. They're using staghorn coral. This is an artificial reef um, specifically for algal hosting for the zooxanthellae. And this one came out of Cambridge and UC San Diego. And then the most recent one is one that came out of Hong Kong using 3D printed terracotta tiles. And finally, you saw the macroalgae um, numbers starting to explode, the coverage. And so this is where diadema is really important. The Florida Aquarium has now successfully um, three times reproduced these diadema juveniles. So they take adults, they spawn them, and they create um, juveniles. But putting them back on the reef, FWC is helping with this research, putting them back on the reef is an unknown. If you put them back on there just willy-nilly, 
they get eaten, they're tasty little morsels. So they need some places to hide. So Bill Sharp is working with some collaborators to come up with these diadema shelters and see if they actually work in terms of having the diadema um, survive and help eat the macroalgae so the corals can, um, can land on the substrate. So that was my call to action for a partnership between restoration practitioners and artificial reef engineers and installers to really come up with a thoughtful way to increase the reef structure using whatever sort of substrates we come up with, the ones I presented, or maybe there are better ones out there to really try and protect our reef to create more reef so that as the Florida Aquarium is producing these babies, there's a place for them to go and that hopefully they will survive. So I really appreciate your time. Um, and if you have any questions, please let me know. All right, that was a wonderful conclusion to our second research and monitoring session. And uh, before I go any further, my name is Anna Sangoni, I'm a Florida Sea Grant Extension Agent in Miami-Dade County and the University of Florida. And we would like to invite all of the panelists in this section to please go ahead and turn your microphones on and your cameras on for our final Q&A session before our break. All right, and uh, my name is Jeff Renchin. I'm with FWC, the Artificial Reef Program. Um, just thanks for all the speakers. Um, please, when you, uh, if you have any questions for the speakers, go ahead and uh, and enter your question into the chat. Um, if you could also direct, uh, put whose name you want to direct the question to as well, so we're not all trying to jumble up, all trying to answer the question together. So, you know, when you guys have time, please uh, enter some some questions in the chat. Um, we've had some that have been answered um, so far in the chat. Um, uh, but I have one here. Maybe we start off with a question to Avery, our first presenter. Um, from your work that you've uh, been collaborating with a lot of different uh, state organizations, um, what type of feedback have you gotten from the states um, in terms of like your estimates for benthic cover? Um, and uh, what's how's your relationship developed with all the different state artificial reef organizations? Sure, thanks, Jeff. I am going to let Damie answer that question as she has been leading the footprint estimation, but um, I will say that from the meta-analysis component that I shared today that we have um, received good feedback. Um, I think the main take home message from that presentation was that yes, globally artificial reefs can enhance fish communities, but local um, criteria for siting are so critical as all of us here at the summit know. So Damie, um, do you wanna take a stab at the question Jeff asked? Absolutely. Um, in reaching out to each of the states individually for our estimate of the benthic footprint, the feedback has been wonderful. Um, we've reached out to each state individually, starting with the southeast, then the entire east coast, Pacific, and now we're just starting out with the Gulf, um, and it's been wonderful feedback. Um, trying to determine what data they're willing to share, understanding that not all data is um, available to go public, and working on what is possible there. And uh, it's been a wonderful process so far. I guess just to elaborate on that, uh, Damie, what um, for any of the county managers here, um, what information has been most beneficial uh, for them to collect? Has there been certain things that that uh, that counties aren't aren't collecting that would be really beneficial for this benthic uh, estimate? Um, the main thing that we've been looking for, um, the three main categories, uh, we have a quantity category, a tonnage category, and a length category in terms of vessels. Um, as I said in the presentation, ideally the actual footprint, if that is available, um, that's the ideal kind of gold standard, but that's not always available. Um, not, we have not all states been able to get to the size scan sonar. That's something that just takes time. Um, but if we are able to account for the number of pipes that have been deployed, the number of reef balls, whatever it may be, um, sometimes that gets lost in older data. So if that at a minimum can be accounted for, um, I think that's huge. And then the dimensions of something that has been deployed, as much information as possible um, makes it a lot easier when going back in and trying to account for the benthic footprint. Thank you. 
I don't know if Avery, there's something you would like to add on to that as well, since we've been working on this project together. No, I think, Jamie, you covered it nicely. I think the main things are information on date, depth, um, as well as information on the amount of structure that's deployed, whether it's tonnage, the length, if it's a vessel, or count, perhaps, if it's modules. Thanks for, for the answer. Uh, shifting gears a little bit, we have a question in the chat, uh, I believe from, from Bill Lindbergh about um, in the Southeast, how does artificial reef bottom coverage compare to the extent of natural hard bottom habitats? And maybe uh, since we have a representative from the Southeast, Sarah, if you wanna um, give a, a, you know, a general idea of what you think uh, in the comparison of the artificial reef coverage with the, with the natural habitat. Well, the natural habitat in the Southeast far outweighs or outcovers what the artificial reef footprint is because um, there's three pretty extensive uh, parallel reef tracks off the coast and our artificial reefs are either in between those reef tracks or you know east of them so but the the hard bottom natural hard bottom is far greater than the artificial reef footprint and may i add on a tiny bit there please please well? do um great answer sarah i completely agree with you i wanted to i guess take a step back and for the study that damie shared of the footprint um estimate the reason we actually started that was you hit the um nail on the head bill is that we were trying to figure out if artificial reefs were a drop in the bucket in terms of coverage compared to the natural reefs and we assumed exactly like sarah said yes they most certainly are um and the analysis so far has continued to support that, but um, our colleagues at NIMS were really interested in, for example, when they're doing their Southeast Fisheries Independent Survey, the CFIS um, sampling protocol, if they should be including artificial reefs or not. And so that's part of um, how that project started. Yeah, that's that's great. Yeah, just because artificial reefs, you know, they are a very small percentage of the of the habitat out there, but they do get a disproportional amount of of effort there. So it's always trying to balance those two, uh, especially when it comes to to thinking about fish populations and, and stock assessments. Uh, so we have another question in the chat um, from Katie, saying, uh, "Have the, any of the presenters who use Bruvs to collect fish data use software to ID?" and to count fish in the videos. So I guess for Mike, this would be a good question for you since you guys used uh, use some bruvs. Um, what's your um, uh, software? Or did you just use a uh, good old fashioned, uh, someone staring at videos? What did you do to, to identify your fish? Uh, yeah, we, we did the, the latter. We did a manual viewing of the video uh, with two separate independent reviewers. So um, we did for um, species richness, we did counts uh, continu uh, continuous viewing of the of the videos where we ID'd every species that showed up and noted its time of first appearance. Uh, then for abundance data, we did um, counts at one minute intervals uh, after we removed the first five minutes of the video. Uh, and for the abundance, um, each reviewer did the mean max or did the max n uh, counts. Uh, at those one minute intervals for each of the species present. And then we did an average of the two counts for, uh, up for between the two reviewers to get a mean max n for each species. Uh, and we used the um, largest mean max n because obviously every minute you might have multiple species with multiple counts each minute. So um, we took the largest mean max n between the, uh, for each species. Thanks, Mike. And I guess just to add on to a question I had earlier in the chat, um, you know, I asked about the, um, you know, you had that great assessment of basically how many samples you need to really get a good representative sample of the species in the area, but also how long would you have to uh, watch these videos? Because we all know time, our time is limited. So what was the most effective amount of time you had to watch these videos to get a good representative number of, of species for each sample? Yes. So um, uh, uh, again, I, I think I commented on early on that the, the full report is available if people want to really delve into a lot of the, the technical aspects of the analyses. But basically, um, I just showed the general overall species accumulation plot, which was all of the data compiled together for each individual sample uh, at each site, which basically was each camera view, uh, which was two to three, depending on the sites. I did species accumulation curves um, for each minute, and that's where I was able to uh, get those percentages. Um, given the, the minimal number of samples at each of the sites in each of the seasons, the um, quanti uh, quantitatively, it was, it was tough to do um, a true quantitative uh, analysis of that data, but I do have individual counts and um, looking at those plots, you do see um, asymptotes at, at begin to be approached or approached for the majority of those samples um, at around the 60 minute mark. So um, 
and based on those counts, uh, the overall data, um, when we did our one minute counts, we had 54 observed species when we did um, species richness at one minute intervals compared to the 62, which was the total observed species. Um, and then 63 was what was suggested. So um, the method is, is definitely robust um, and there it, it does provide a good representation of the samples and that 60 minute mark appears to be a, a good um, a good in between point um, for for assessing the data with 86% of the species observed because uh, our videos range from an hour and 45 minutes to two hours and 15 minutes depending on uh, basically the temperatures the water and how quick the batteries died. Thanks Mike. Um... So we have a question. Let's get uh, let's get Amber in this mix here. Um, so we have a question for from her from Shelby. Is, uh, do you know of anyone uh, releasing diadema with artificial structures um, or anything like that? Said so they're excited about their outplanting corals with CRF and, and University of Miami. Um, so yeah, is that is that something that's being done or something that people are talking about doing? Hi, thanks, Shelby. Um, and Shelby helps out a lot in the Patterson Lab um, at University of Florida, so she knows a lot about the diadema. Um, right now, we're still in the research stages, so FWC um, is doing that for, the, for us at the South Florida Lab. Um, we're also starting, we have a NOAA grant with University of Miami, and we've started to send them juvenile diadema too, so they'll be putting them out also in different designs. So right now, I don't think that there's an answer to that. Pretty much everything Bill puts out gets eaten within 12 hours. So it's something that will have to be figured out before we do large scale um, replanting, outplanting. Yeah, that's great. I know they've been they've been doing some research in FWC with uh, when they when they raise those diadema, they have to put predators in there with them in their tanks. If they don't, they just don't know how to hide from predators. So I mean, that's something, you know, we have to, have to look into for future outplanning of, of diadema. And actually um, an exciting an exciting result that they got was the um, juveniles that we sent down reacted the same way as the wild urchins did. And we think that that's because once they leave the larval culture lab, they go into the coral greenhouses. And so they're in there with some predators. So we think that that makes a difference having that condition. Very, very interesting. Uh, so we had a question I, I uh, missed before, um, just from clarification that Tyler wanted from from Dami about um, does the benthic footprint estimate that you spoke about um, in your presentation is that um, available surface area or is that the seafloor footprint? Uh, that is the seafloor footprint, the actual area that is covered by um, the deployed structures. Great, and and also for another one for for Dami from Sean, you're very you're very popular today with your with your work. It's probably because it's very exciting work. Is uh, does uh, North Carolina mapping data designate um, unpublished artificial reefs? And if so, were those a component of your data? So are, are basically are all those those inside permitted areas or all the side scan? Maybe all the side scan just happens in the permitted areas, and they don't do any side scan outside. Um, our study is only looking at uh, permitted artificial reefs. Um, that's what we are currently fo focusing on, and that accounts for all states. In terms of the side scan sonar in North Carolina, I will refer to Avery um, as to where that actually occurs outside of permitted areas. I will let you answer the rest of that, Avery. Um, yeah, so I'm not entirely sure I got the question, but um, I think what you were asking, Sean, and that you relayed, Jeff, was that um, where is the mapping done? Um, and so the state of North Carolina is a really interesting case because they have a uh, full side scan sonar of, I believe, all of their permitted artificial reef plots and the structures that have been deployed inside of those. And so we've been using that for the actual footprint um, data estimation. And then our team, so I'm with NOAA and uh, NINCOS, National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science, and we do a lot of habitat mapping and part of the habitat mapping team. So there's much more habitat mapping data of available from areas that aren't um, designated artificial reefs. So I don't know if that fully answers your question, Sean. But. Well, I guess I think he was specifically wondering about, you know, with, with the foster and all the other research vessels that go up there and constantly map when they're moving, have you found um, a significant portion of unpublished artificial material oh. outside the permitted areas that maybe is significant or maybe it's just it's so it's so dispersed that maybe it's not a, a significant factor of artificial reef material? 
Got it. Um, so I think with that understanding of the question, then yes, we're finding lots of, there's shipwrecks, uh, many of which the locations are known, some of which are features that our team or collaborators have detected in other surveys and have gone back to try to then identify with archaeologists and get more information on. Uh, but we're not seeing off North Carolina any like unpermitted per se artificial reefs, at least we haven't. Um, encountered any, but there are different models in different states, right? In some of the Gulf states, as you all know, there's the broader artificial reef zones. Um, and so there's different levels of information in terms of resolution of what information is available. Um, and there's an interesting example in the Northeast, for example, where um, structures are deployed, but until that reef is sponsored, the coordinates of those structures aren't available to the general public. Um, so yeah, kind of nuances. Well, I think it's, um, Anna, you wanna, you wanna wrap, wrap this up now? I think we're, we don't wanna cut too much into everyone's break time because uh, I know everyone's probably gonna get a little screen fatigue here after watching all these PowerPoints, but uh, it is great information. Yeah, we want to thank all of the speakers for sharing their information and answering questions. And we encourage all of the participants to reach out to them separately, whether it be through the Feedloop platform or through email. And we are going to go ahead and paste the link to take you back to the lobby. And we have a 10 minute break. So the next Zoom link will be posted in the lobby chat for the 1130 Socioeconomics and Human Dimensions session. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you back in 10 minutes. Thanks to our speakers. Thanks to our participants. And we'll see you uh, take a break. And we'll see you all in 10, 15 minutes.